Shall we start? Ibrahim, are we ready to go? Yes. Okay. So for those of you uh, who didn't meet with uh, Dr. Pilici, I think that's John, right? Yeah. John came today. So I want to introduce you very shortly. Uh, so Dr. Pilici is uh, our academic director at Zeha Institute, and he's also a sociology professor at uh, CUNY. Uh, and he's teach, uh, for the summer school, he's uh, teaching us the Kurdish intellectual profiles. And today, I believe he's going to present on Ahmad Khani and Said Nursi. Right. We might not have time for Said Nursi. We'll cover Said Nursi and Jagger Quinn tomorrow. Sure. Oh. <coughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, those of you who uh, had uh, the opportunity to hear my first uh, presentation. I kind of uh, offered a kind of a survey of uh, Kurdish uh, intellectual history. You know, mostly literary folks, but some later it becomes political and a modern in the modern sense of uh, intellectual. Uh, today we are gonna be talking about uh, Ahmed Khani. He is the uh, one of the founding fathers of Kurdish uh, literature and uh, the most important author in terms of symbolic value of Kurdish literature. And the key text is Memuzin. Memuzin is the the story that represents Kurds, uh, uh, chronicles their uh, kind of uh, love story, so to say, and people have interpreted it in many ways. So I'm not going to go into the literary aspect of Memuzin. In this presentation, I am pr primarily interested in Ahmed Khani's own self-presentation, how he defines this enterprise, how he locates his uh, kind of... Uh, contribution within Kurdish history and with respect to other nations and peoples. So I'm going to be kind of doing a little more theoretical connections between Khani and uh, his work, uh, I mean, uh, Memuzin. Uh, so I have uh, photocopies. I hope we have enough copies for you guys. It is more than we are going to use, so uh, we are going to use a limited number of pages. Uh, this, yeah. So the book is um, is a love story, um, as I said, uh, authored in around, approximately in 1692, uh, and as I mentioned in the in a previous session, uh, this is a typical story like Romeo and Juliet, um, Leila and Mejnun, and uh, many other uh, love stories. It is a failed, unsuccessful love story, which makes it great. So love <laughs> gets uh, more uh, dramatic and tragic. Uh, uh, so there are the two main characters. Mem is a young man who he falls in love with uh, Zin, who is the daughter of uh, uh, the governor of Botan uh, principality, Mir. Uh, Kurdish uh, principalities are called uh, Mirs, and so there were, uh, we heard about uh, their stories. Um, and so the, the two lovers uh, come across each other at a festival. It's in a Ruz, in a Ruz festival which is a special uh, holiday for Kurds. It's the beginning of uh, spring. It's a uh, renewal, so it, and March 21st. 21st. Yes. So in many ways, this story also celebrates Kurdish holiday, uh, puts it in center stage, and it, it emphasizes rebirth, kind of renewal, rejuvenation. Um, the other characters in the story uh, are Beko, which is Bekir. He is the bad guy, uh, basically. He's the conspirator, the person who sets uh, Mem and the prince against each other. Uh, and uh, eventually, he's responsible for uh, the death of uh, Mem. Uh, and uh, 
So there are two major uh, moments. One is the hunting expedition where when Prince goes uh, hunting and Mem uh, and Zin they meet and uh, once uh, Prince is aware of their uh, relationship, uh, Beko uh, gives kind of ideas to uh, to have uh, Mem uh, in prison. So he's uh, he's put in uh, jail and he dies. Uh, and uh, in response to this, uh, uh, Mem's best friend and kind of friend of uh, Prince as well, Tajdin, another uh, the good uh, person in the story, he kills uh, Beko as a kind of uh, act of revenge and uh, his loyalty to his uh, friend Mem. And so Beko is killed and Zin kills herself because Mem is dead and... Uh, and uh, so one of the interesting aspects of the story is that the, these three people are buried in the same place, Mem, Zin, and Beko is also buried there. So finally, uh, Mem and Zin, their dream is that, you know, we couldn't meet in this world, but, you know, uh, after that in the grave we will, uh, we will be uh, united. But Beko's bl blood uh, sinks and seeps in between them, and there a thorny rose grows. And it prevents them, you know, union is not uh, uh, completed even afterwards. So, uh, in a very, you know, very br briefly, in a nutshell, that's uh, the story. You can read more and, uh, you know, watch videos about that. Uh, hopefully, in other contexts, we can talk about the content from literary point of view as well. I, so, uh, I have, uh, in this uh, document, you we have... Uh, up to section let's see, seven included. I think. Yeah. So the, uh, the if you look at the page content page, you can uh, get a glimpse of the story. Basically, uh, we have so up to uh, section seven, and we are gonna focus on section five, the plight of the curve. And we are going to read. This is a translation by an Iraqi Kurdish uh, professor of English literature. I must say it's not uh, perfect, okay, but it's the only available uh, full translation. Hopefully, as Zara Institute, we are going to produce a better translation, an improved translation at least, of this uh, classical work. Uh, but it is uh, still pretty decent, and we can... Uh, study it. Now, in the, uh, this is typical of such classical works. It starts with praise of God and, you know, um, salawat to Prophet Muhammad. So it's a kind of acknowledging, recognizing, uh, um, and praising uh, uh, God and Prophet. And so, and then he offers a kind of historical, political uh, uh, background to this enterprise. So we are skipping those uh, Nice, really poetic, uh, religious uh, sections. One part is interesting because on page 21, uh, since we had a discussion on Yezidis, okay? Oh, okay. So if you look at uh, page 21, that's where he says, The poor and the, and the guiltless Iblis, he had so much of your solicitude. He submitted a thousand times a day. So you allowed him to have his way, not bowing to anybody except his idol, rejecting your replacement as idol. He did, he did not bow once before an outsider. Your sorrow put him forever in fire. So Iblis, Satan, does not bow to Adam, and hence his, uh, he becomes a uh, devil. So this, I think, is interesting. It, there is some Yezidi resonance almost in this uh, treatment of uh, Iblis here. So in uh, section 3, there is almost a kind of creation myth in Sufi Islam. It starts with uh, uh, theological distinction between wujub and uh, imkan, necessity and contingency. The domain of necessity is the domain of divinity, contingency, 
or imkan is the domain of the creation. Things that could exist and not exist, and as a result of divine choice, uh, they exist. And it talks about the pen, the souls, and the mind. So this corresponds to light. There is also a kind of illuminationist uh, component in Ahmed Khani. Uh, something we find in more full-fledged form in Suhra Verdi and such philosophers, uh, Muslim philosophers. And the soul refers to ethos and the mind refers to logos. So it's a that kind of unfolding of existence uh, starting from uh, a pen that writes and that's the Nuru Muhammadi, it's the light of Muhammad. So God creates the world with a pen which is Prophet Muhammad's uh, kind of spirit or so. So this myth had, has equivalent or co corresponding stories in other traditions, you know, in Christianity and especially Indian uh, creation story. We're not going to go into those things, but I, I feel like I should just a little mention and it might be of interest to some of you. Uh, so Prophet Muhammad is like a strait between imkan and buju, between the possible and the necessary. And then we come down on earth, uh, there's a critique of other nations, uh, failure of uh, Torah and Bible, and you know how Prophet Muhammad with his sword and Quran, he kind of conquers the world, and, uh, and then the entire existence submits to him, from minerals, plants, animals, to Adam's sons, and so on. It goes all the way to uh, 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 companions, and then uh, the poor souls and so on, it comes uh, all the way down to the moment. In a sense, he's kind of giving theological, uh, historical background to his moment in history. All right. Now, page, uh, sorry, section 5, page 29. Typical of Sufi poetry, he's uh, addressing a uh, cup bearer, you know, he's in a bar, you know, pour the wine, you know, it's the place for uh, drinking. And, uh, of course, this is uh, metaphorical. Uh, Ahmed Khani was a pious person, you know, it, but it must be enjoyable to imagine, you know, drinking wine, I, I guess, <laughs> since in paradise that's going to happen, Muslims believe. Uh, o cup bearer, will you, for God's sake, pour a drop of wine into the kingly, so the glass may show the sphere, whatever is wished shall become clear. You can read it yourself a little bit, actually, and I need some better uh, reader who can read poetry. John, would you like to do it for, for us? Sure. Okay, thank you. To reveal the situation for each when the welfare is within reach, our retreat is complete. Is it now likely to cease, or will it go on further until we all return? Is it possible in the cycle of the orbit that our star will rise in the planet that our luck may become loving, that it will wake up once from slumbering, that a world refuge for us emerges and a king for us appears, the power of our art to be established, the value of our pen to be confirmed, our plight to be remedied, our learning to be demanded. If we had a proud leader, generous, and a patron of literature, our currency would be minted coinage, not so doubtful and worthless exchange, though it is pure and distinct, more precious is the coin of the mint. If we had a king, God had seen him worthy of the crown. A throne for him was established. Our fortune would have brightened. Okay, let me say a few things and then we'll continue from there. So, in this uh, part that uh, we heard, he's, uh, he's uh, kind of taking a glance at the condition of uh, Kurds, the plight of uh, Kurds as a people. And uh, you can see the references to uh, our luck, fortune, as a people. So the idea of felek, fortune, destiny, kader, uh, these uh, play a significant role in the interpretation of history, in the interpretation of a, a community's condition at this time. This is very pre-modern uh, uh, way of reading uh, your condition. You find yourself in some, uh, you know, miserable or lucky environment, but it's not your own achievement that much. There, you know, you need some aid, some support from God, 
to uh, allow you to succeed. You know, so it's a kind of biological relationship with the, you know, with uh, heavenly powers, uh, spiritual powers, and with stars. Basically, the whole idea of you know your star rising or not. Uh, so the plight of curse uh, for it to be remedied, uh, and and so you can see two things being paired here. One is political plight, uh, failure, or uh, trouble that Kurds have found themselves in. A remedy for that, and also learning, is always paired with this political situation. So we will see in this entire section these two components constantly uh, resurfacing. Okay? Politics and literature go together in this text. Yes? Is there also is the other being a similarity between the Sufi understanding of like before the oneness connection with God and how you know through living uh, individuals separate from God is there a uh, is he, so by first referencing uh, the uh, vine and paradise then going to apply the religion is he drawing a parallels between these two concepts Wine here is like a, you know, uh, clearing your mind, you know, focusing very much like fortune tellers, basically telling you your fortune. You know, this sphere, what is it called? It's, uh, globe. Globe, yeah, you know, they look at it and they tell you, you know. Uh, crystal ball, thank you, yeah, it's crystal ball. So uh, there is that uh, image here being invoked. So it's a matter of, okay, you know, let me think about myself, you know, where do I stand? You know, often, so you don't say it, you ask someone else. So the crystal ball is a mirror, basically. In the past, people were holding it for you, and you could see yourself in their words, and, and so on. And it was, of course, speculative uh, Im 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 imagination only. Uh, but here, it's more metaphorical, of course. He's, he's saying those things, and but he's, you know, getting the wine and, and uh, w looking at the crystal ball is uh, uh, giving him the picture of the Kurds as a uh, uh, people. We also see here uh, uh, references to currency, coinage, and so on. All those things are, from earlier lectures, those things are closely associated with sovereignty. Sovereign powers, if you are state, you mint coins. Darpane. You have money. Money that refers to you. So our currency would be minted uh, coinage, <clears throat> not so doubtful and worthless exchange. Mm -hmm. Kurdish currency is doubtful, invalid, uh, suspicious, uh, you know, does it even, is it accepted? Uh, and so there is that uh, element that will uh, come up. And if we had a king, God had seen him worthy of a crown. Yeah, let's continue then. Please. If a crown had been obtained, prosperity would certainly have been attained. He would have looked after us, the orphans, and would have protected us from the villains. The Turks would not have beaten us at all. Our land would not be ruins under the owl. Ruled and oppressed by the riffraff, overcome and subjected to the Tajiks and the Turks' dictate. But God from eternity so willed, these Turks and Persians against us unleashed. If subordination to them is so shameful, it is for the famous disgraceful. It is disgraceful for the ruler and the prince to subject the poor and the poet to injustice. Anyone who raised the sword resolutely would seize the state for himself courageously. That is why the world is like a bride, falling in the hand drawing the sword. The bride's deed, contract, and dowry are kindness, forgiveness, and generosity. I wisely asked the world, what is your dowry? Determination, it said. Thus the world by sword and benevolence surrenders to that kind of man. I wonder at the wisdom of the Lord, the Kurds at the state of the world. For what reason is their deprivation? For what purpose is their condemnation? Yep. Thank you. So we, we see throne, crown, uh, and kind of uh, misfortune being overcome with prosperity. Uh, Kurds are uh, conceptualized here as orphans who are suffering at the hands of Turks and Tajiks. Tajiks refers to Persians in, in this case. Uh, 
and um, and the, our land would not be ruins under the owl. Owl land in ruins, you know, and they are in quiet places and so on, where there is no activity, where there is decay, degeneration, destruction, and so on. So the the position of Kurds in the landscape of uh, let's say human geography, uh, one of the last uh, lines here, I wonder at the wisdom of the Lord, divine wisdom, the curse at the state of the world, and it can be, at, you know, in the, at, in this, let, in the kind of context of the world, where curse stands is quite interesting because, you know, we know approaching 40 millions of people living uh, in a, uh, situation where their identity and language and so on is not recognized. So people talk about it as the largest ethnic group, stateless group. Is that true? I, I'm not sure anymore. People have you know, <laughs> contested that uh, claim. Nevertheless, we know that for their size and uh, uh, numbers, Kurds' uh, lack of state is uh, a glaring fact. And so early on, this becomes visible. I should, uh, of course, it is time to note the fact that uh, this text was uh, produced at a time when Turkish and Ottoman and Safavid empires were in collusion course, there were conflicts, recent wars, and then there is a relative peace that comes afterwards uh, because of their collaboration with the uh, Ottoman side mostly. The, most of the Kurdish principalities, they gain some autonomy. And some Kurdish political capacity is secured, which allows for literary flourishing. So the works of literature emerges around this time, and Khani is uh, one of them, and the most self-conscious one of them, I must say. So it is not only the having the luxury, the capacity, the uh, um, kind of infrastructure for producing literary works, but also being aware of one's political conditions, uh, are both are uh, available in Khani's writings that we don't find in other works. In other works, we find literary production unselfconsciously produced. They're basically right, doing literature. It happens to be in Kurdish, sure, but it could have been in Farsi. But in Khani, there is a deliberate effort to write in Kurdish, and you know, he, he states this, and so we are going to see that as well. His references to sword, uh, seizing power, uh, are also very interesting. Uh, he, he is a realist, you know, if you are an IR person, international relations or comparative politics. Uh, you know, there are classes uh, of uh, uh, different approaches in um, international uh, relations uh, theories. Uh, realism basically says if you have power, you know, yeah, you should act and you should control, and, you know, what matters most is power. Here, too, in the matters of state, uh, in its kind of perhaps uh, unsympathetic version, it is violence. But you know, more acceptable form. It is power that matters. You have to be powerful, and if there is a sword, you should own it. You should hold it, and that's how you can secure statehood. We know this is true. All the states are born out of wars, ethnic cleansing, and killings, and you know, all kinds of violence. So statehood and uh, violence are closely related. But he is also a kind man. He says, you know, the dowry of uh, a bride, in this case, you know, it's like a, a it's like a, a situation where they they overcome this uh, misfortune uh, through power, and then by asserting yourself in in the field, and then you have to supplement this, reinforce this with kindness, forgiveness, and generosity. So you have to be compassionate and you know friendly and so on. So he asks the world, what is your dowry? It's determination he meant. That is uh, being uh, uh, disciplined, showing effort, hard work, basically. All right. So that was, a, you know, uh, again, we are moving from uh, divinely uh, uh, determined or uh, divine uh, kind of... Uh, unfortunate conditions towards responsibility 
uh, for the kerns. So, you know, you start to see the transition from, you know, unluckiness, ruins, to sword and sense of responsibility and so, all right, let's move on. They seized by sword the city of Bay and forced a resolute country to take. Every one of them is as generous as Hattie. Yeah. Every one of them is as brave as Brewster. Notice that between the Arabs and the Georgians is Kurdish, becoming like the towers. Besieged by these Persians and Turks in the four corners are all Kurds. The two sides have made the tribe of the Kurds a target to eliminate with their arrows, because at the borders they are keys, and each community is a strong barrier. These seas of the Turks and the Tajik, whenever they move or stir, the Kurds become stained with blood. They keep them apart like a strait. Resolution, bravery, and generosity, courage, princeliness, and endurance, that is the medal of the Kurds, shown by sword and equitable fervor. Though they are jealous of bravery, they are coy of charity, this fervor and utmost <coughs> zeal, rejecting charity in any deal. That is why they are disunited, always rebellious and divided. If we could have an agreement, together, following a leading establishment, the Turks, Arabs, and Persians entirely all would have been our servants. We would have completed the religion and the state. We would have attained the knowledge and wisdom. The articles would have been distinguished. The excellent would have attained perfection. All right, thank you. So now we see some, uh, you know, praise for Kurdish bravery, that Kurds are capable of achieving things. Uh, this is a place where he overlaps with nationalistic sentiment, and so you can, you know, retrospectively interpret this as a kind of nationalist uh, mood on the part of the author. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, heroic culture was part of, uh, you know, traditional uh, uh, societies. He's invoking those uh, sentiments for people. And he, he calls uh, Kurds as uh, people who are as generous as Hatem. Hatem Itai is a famous figure uh, closely associated with generosity. Um, anyone knows the story of Hatem Itai? No? It's mentioned in the Rizale. Hatem Itai is... Geometrikikai is... Hatem Itai. Yeah. 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 You want to say The Kurdi version. Okay. Ciao, Um The Mm -hmm. So he's so generous uh, person that uh, he he um, he lights a fire in his tent or near his tent at night and also yeah, generate some sounds, sings. Then chow that, huh? Okay. Uh, okay, so he has a dog that barks at night so that, you know, the passerby will be aware of, you know, some settlement or some presence of human being or fire and they will be curious and come and he would offer people things. The story I know is actually different. The story I know is that one uh, guy who is uh, very rich and very proud, of course, a little arrogant, he thinks <laughs> I'm the best guy and I'm offering you all those things. So they say, he says, is there anybody richer than me? You know, better than me? They say, yeah, that is a guy. He says, how come? I'm, I do my best, you know. I should be the you know, most generous person. And uh, they say, yeah, Atemi Tai, where does he live? He's, they say he's a Bedouin, you know, he lives in that area. So he says, okay, let me go and find the guy. So on his way, he comes across an old man carrying uh, uh, tree branches, you know, whatever uh, stuff to burn he has collected. And he says, uh, hey, uh, have you uh, heard there is a big, uh, oh, he's giving big, uh, um, 
a festival or whatever, uh, he's giving a dinner invitation, big invitation. He says, no, there is a huge invitation. You know, why don't you go uh, there uh, to, uh, to enjoy the food and all those things? And the old man says, no, I, I won't go and feel uh, indebted to uh, that rich guy. Instead, I will carry my, you know, a load and uh, eat my own food, something like this, he says. And uh, the guy says, wow. And he asks his name also, and he's Hatemitai, basically. Uh, that's the story I know. I might be wrong, but it's something like that. He's a uh, 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 person of contentment and absolute generosity, something like that. Anyway, so... Uh, Kurds are considered to be very uh, generous and also brave in this uh, story. And uh, we see a kind of geographical delimitation of Kurds or a description of Kurdish uh, 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 demographic uh, distribution here. Uh, so from Arabs up to the Georgians, Kurds are like towers. You know, you can think of maybe mountains and you can think of communities scattered around uh, the landscape, and uh, they are surrounded by the Persians and the Turks, and they are scattered in all four corners. These four corners, although it's that's how it is mentioned in this text, it, it is again interpreted by later retrospective nationalist uh, uh, commentators as a reference to the current state of Kurds, where <laughs> Kurdistan is divided into four parts and people talk about it, right? Iraq, Syria, Iran, and Turkey. But, you know, that division is much more recent and modern. And so this is more like, you know, uh, all over the place, basically. That's what it means. The Kurds are in all over the place, you know, scattered. Uh, but uh, they are surrounded by Turks and uh, Persians. When Turks and Persians are uh, much more numerous, organized armies, therefore he compares them to the seas, like oceans, when they... Uh, the waves of them uh, hit uh, Kurds, Kurds are stuck in between them or when they collide with each other, when they have conflict uh, in situations of war, the Kurds uh, find themselves uh, in between. They, they are stained with blood, he says, and they keep them apart like a strait. So Kurds are like an intermediate buffer uh, zone, I buffer people, all the, the two empires. And this is so uh, true in terms of what history tells us about the condition of Kurds. Uh, parts of the Kurds are in alliance with Iranians, others with Ottomans. Uh, so, again, praise of Kurdish uh, bravery. Um, uh, and after that comes a crucial part, I think, and it's theoretically interesting. Uh, translation might not reveal it in its full clarity, and, and I think that's why it, it, it can be better rendered, rendered uh, better than this. Though they are jealous of bravery, uh, that is, they would uh, love to be brave, and they would uh, try to say, yeah, I, I should be braver than others, and so on. They are coy of charity. This fervor and utmost zeal, rejecting charity in any deal, that is why they are disunited, always rebellious and divided. So Kurds are a kind of people who are very generous, but they, they are always disunited. And why, what is the reason for this uh, lack of unity? Why Kurds are so acting individually or, you know, tribally? Uh, there is no unity. Khani's explanation for this, and this is echoed by later Kurdish intellectuals like Bedou Zaman and others in Munazaran. Uh, Kurds tend to, not, they prefer their independence. So they don't accept indebtedness. They don't want to be indebted to other people. Why is this important? Let me find the original thing. 
Det vil jeg da bede. Ja. Jeg vil da Tahsin Doski. Tahsin Doski. He could show some evidence that, especially about 30 years after Ahmed Yahani, some copy of a magazine was written. So it is going to be copied in time. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, Martin van Brunessen is a you know a major scholar of Kurdish studies. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard the name. Uh, he would rightly criticize, and I agree. You know, the kind of the nationalist uh, um, uh, characteristics that are attributed to the text are a little anachronistic or too much retrospective interpretation. However, however, it. It, it, there is also the fact that Ahmed Khani is a pioneer person, a frontier person, uh, a modernity that he experienced and articulated in this text that was triggered by quite unusual uh, situation and uh, the conflict between the Persians and the Turks empires made Kurdish political reality naked to the eyes of the Kurds. So suddenly you have armies on one side and armies on the other side. They are clashing. Your best bet is to side with, with somebody. And suddenly you say, who am I? Why do I not have my own army? Why am I not an army? Why do we not have our own prince or king and so on? So the idea of sovereignty, political subjectivity, becomes uh, a theme, an issue for him, for many other people that, that, that doesn't happen. Even for many people who have state, they, they might not deal with that question. But as a stateless, as a member and representative of a stateless people at the time, or smaller principalities who are in disunity, Khani is like a person who rises above the, his condition. And so my kind of subtitle for this section, for my entire discussion today, is less about the literature part, but it is about the birth of Kurdish political subjectivity. The birth of Kurdish political subjectivity. So Khani is Memuzin is a place where political subjectivity is born. Subjectivity means sense of selfhood. Self-reflexivity that we find in Khani is very modern. But he's pre-modern. He lives in pre-modern times. So the national criticism against uh, na or attribution of nationalism might be wrong, but the fact that Khani is ahead of his time in many ways is also right. So I think we have to have a balanced uh, uh, stand uh, stance on this on this question of nationalism. Now my evidence, I'm sure I think this is my original contribution, but I have to write it. Uh, <laughs> my own evidence for his uh, novelty and originality has to do with social contract theory. We find uh, social contract theory in Khani, and let me locate the, uh, uh, yeah, I think I found it. Okay, so I'm gonna read the original uh, Kurdish version. And we can see. Yeah. So, Jiwa Meri, who he met, or Sahabet, Merini, or Hiret, or Jeladet, 
او ختم ji bo qebîle ekrad wan dane bi şîr û himmetê dad hindî ji şecaetê xeyûrin ew çende ji minetê nefûrin as much as they are invested in courage and bravery they hate minnet minnet is like a you feel indebtedness okay feeling you know i owe you something so they don't enter into contract they don't engage in a situation that ties people so they are wild in plain terms they avoid civility they do not enter into social contract now this is written in uh 6 17th century right and we have modern social contract theories in the west of course we have early greek you know origins for social contract theories how many of you are familiar with the idea of social contract people in political science uh, are certainly familiar for example massachusetts is called what state of massachusetts or something else you don't know virginia commonwealth what does that mean <laughs> see it's a british uh, artifact yeah so people together is called commonwealth okay uh people what, what do you mean people together commonwealth people who are okay the idea of city in greek times didn't did not mean a place it meant political community people who are entangled in each other so people who share something and so therefore they have common language and people who do not share that language with them were called what people outside of the city but 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 thank you their speech was not recognized therefore they were called barbarians okay so berber berbers in uh, in uh, in morocco uh, and north africa they are called berbers because of romans calling them berbers yeah barbarians berber yeah so the city basically refer to a p- community of people who are in uh solidarity with each other and they have a common political orientation okay so commonwealth whenever you see it it means state but state in this expanded sense of the city social contract here is john locke american declaration of independence is inspired and kind of defined within the framework of a social contract theory. American founding fathers followed the idea of social contract which is the basis of liberalism. So if I mention a couple of main names you will see Hobbes for example, Thomas Hobbes, his Leviathan is about that. You submit to a king or authority uh in you so you give your ability to kill others. So you sacrifice your will wildness and your uh lifestyle of being independent by yourself with your arms and so on in exchange for law and security that is uh, provided by a collective power a sovereign power a, a, a god on earth basically and that's the state okay so this is common uh, common wealth or social contract here we find that in hobbs as well so whenever you see state of nature versus social contract state of nature common wealth we are talking about social contract here if you see a city called jerusalem or darus salam it means social contract place it means commonwealth the place where peace is secured because in the state of nature there is conflict uh, there is war of war against all i mean w- yeah war of all against all uh, so it's very interesting that in a, huh? according to some according to like yeah. so state of nature is peaceful and peaceful, peaceful yeah yeah so yeah there are debates about it but in in islamic tradition and uh, that's also my own contribution I'm, i hate to say it but uh, there is this darul harb and darul islam darul harb is state of nature so all those people saying you know they declare jihad and so on darul harb means absence of a contract in the absence of a contract anything goes everything is free okay contract binds 
it limits your action, but also it binds parties to each other. So you, when you sign a contract, you, be, you, you are accountable. Now, this idea of social contract, so Hugo Grotius, who is a big name in uh, legal tradition and uh, Hobbes in political theory, Puffendorf, uh, Locke, these are all 1651, 1673, 1689, and later, much later, uh, Kant in philosophy. Th these people have talked about uh, social contract. Uh, and the basis of social contract is the creation of civility. So pacification through agreement and, uh, and the sense of in, you know, citizenship and civic virtue, uh, the idea of republic is all based on that. Now, of course, so people who have read Ahmed Khani so far, they wouldn't notice this much, I think, because you know it feels like okay. But I think it's very significant because he makes that contrast. He says that they are so generous and you know giving and you know ready to uh, sacrifice. Uh, but when it comes to being indebted, minet, I think I have to work on you know what will be the best expressions to uh, to phrase uh, this idea. Uh, uh, this sense of g not gratitude but indebtedness, feeling that to the other party is the basis of civilization and civility. If you look at Nietzsche and Freud, who is influenced by Nietzsche, uh, the free person is the person who who is not influenced by society. Okay, wild person. Society, to the extent society influences you. It cultivates a wound in you, and that is called conscience, vijdan. So a person who is vijdansis is an uncivil person who lacks conscience. And conscience is sense of guilt. So guilt happens when you say, oh, I'm doing something wrong, I shouldn't do that. So you, you can say that only if you see other people as part of yourself, or you have a connection. Okay, so civility is is this process of people being entangled in, in each other, feeling indebted to each other, uh, generating a common language mutually uh, intelligible to them, and that's how they become a polit you know, politically unified entity. And that is called state. Whether they have a king or not doesn't matter. That is the state level. Okay. So Kurds, when you look at Kurds, they are totally fragmented, atomized. Biologically, they are related, so there is kinship. There is Kabila, Ashiret, there is you know family, but these are all biological connections. Whereas state is based on a political connection. It's a, a, if it is democratic, it is civil, horizontal. But if it is uh, non-democratic, it's then sovereign power. You are not related to king uh, through kinship or family. Uh, you are subject to it. You are part of it. And so that's one form of state. In a democracy, People are unrelated to each other, and kinship is totally undermined, if you notice. Uh, but what, what is it that relates people to each other? Law, yeah. law maybe. Yeah, well, law is exactly yeah rule of law, and you know you obey the law, and so law protects you. So, Okay, so this is kind of a little background to uh, hopefully shed some light on these lines where he says, I'm, I want to read it again. Eukhiretu <laughs> ev... Uluwi he met Bumani Hamle Bari Minet. Yeah, sorry, the next line is also on the same theme. I should read both. Hindi ji shajaate khayurin, ew chende ji minete nefurin. They are so into bravery and, you know, uh, <coughs> success, performance in heroism and so on, and yet they so hate being indebted to others. So they are totally wide, you know, like rugged, uh, independent person. You can think of American individualism as one form of it, which is related to notions of liberty and sovereign of sovereignty of individual. This, this sense of dignity, grandeur, whatever, and uh, uh, independence became an obstacle to their indebtedness, meaning in the sense of their civility. If I were to translate this, that would what it would mean. So it costs them their civility. Mm. Feel free to ask questions. So, uh, yeah. This, 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 this,
because you have to be settled to yeah. engage in, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, modern statehood uh, emerges <coughs> only if you have a uh, city. Without city, there isn't state. You can be a family, tribe, and so on. You can be great warriors, but you won't be a state. So then you think who is like a Khanis audience? So who can read like this? Like a pre the pre leader of principality or like a madrasa's students? Who is his audience, you think? Yeah. I think like uh, many other authors who feel they are ahead of their time, you know, they, they aim at future, I think. So they hope that people will understand them at, at, at the time. But they, he's so self-aware of what he's doing because he's, you know, building an edifice of, you know, poetry but a political uh, prospectus, yeah. And he's, he's, he knows that this is something Kurds need. Uh, if we read, uh, thank you for the question, which allows us to make transition for uh, the next uh, section. Uh, are you okay with continuing, uh, John? Thank you. I truly appreciate because it's terrible to hear uh, poetry in, in uh, <laughs> non-native speech. <so. laughs> My kids, uh, they prefer their mother <laughs> to hear stories. I said, I do this in job. They say, no, I prefer her. But uh, now we read Greek myths, and I think I'm doing a good job. <laughs> Section 6. Section 6, please. It's a shorter one and also related to what we had earlier. Of perfection, Khani is devoid. The field of perfection he saw is void. That is acting not with expertise and ability, perhaps due to tribalism and partiality. In short, stubbornly, albeit out of injustice, he embarked on this unusual novelty, pouring limpid drink to the dreg as the pearl of the Kurdish tongue, bringing it into order and regularity, suffering hardship for the sake of the public, so that people might not say the Kurds have no origin knowledge and base, various nations have their own books with the sole exception of Kurds. Also, the foresighted may not say, the Kurds do not make love one of their aims, that they are neither desiring nor desired, that they are neither lovers nor beloved, that they have no share of love, neither real nor metaphoric. The Kurds do not lack much perfection, they are orphans lacking opportunities. In the whole, they are not so ignorant and uneducated, perhaps they are humble and unprotected, had we but a okay, yeah, no, sorry, thank you. So this uh, section uh, is, you know, why this book is written in Kurdish, basically. It's offering an explanation, justification, a reminder, and so on. Uh, he is suffering from the fact that Kurds are in a miserable condition, and the field of... A, a, excellence, perfection, it means the, the room for excellence is possible. If you think of Greek uh, culture, you know, so it was yeah, every individual who had to strive towards perfection, the entire, you know, teleological conception of uh, universe and human being was just, you have to aim for perfection and make yourself excellent. Sports were part, part, was part of it and so on. And literature and art was part of it. Now, when he talks about the field of perfection, he's referring to literary field, you know, art and uh, uh, war and areas that uh, one can uh, be heroic, achieve some super uh, superior level. So he says, I found it devoid. It's empty, you know. We are all trying to find food, and nobody is engaged in writing <coughs> poetry and you know producing uh, art. So he's he's kind of saying, okay, I do it. I know not many people. I might not be perfect, but you know that I, we know that there is a, that this is a need. And uh, he he says, in short, stubbornly, albeit out of injustice, he embar embarked on this unusual novelty. This is also a unusual and novel thing to say because he picks and this takes us back to the story Memuzin's story is based on the story of Meme Alan a story that was already in the Kurdish oral tradition and being told for a couple of centuries uh, and uh, Ahmed Khani says you know what I'm going to take this story as raw material and build a new story which he produces Memuzin so Memuzin is based on an oral version of a story turned into uh, and developed, basically. So he knows 
that culture is something that can be uh, developed and uh, purified and perfected. And so he does it. And he uses a form. It's a written also uh, uh, form, very uh, important. And he's very self-conscious. This degree of self-reflexivity uh, is very modern. Traditional author, traditional society leaves its life as truth, as reality. In modernity, we think about ourselves, the self and you know, I and me become so distinct. This is possible to the extent you start to say that, you know, uh, yeah, so it is related to Felek and destiny thing, but I'm not going to develop that here. Uh, so, uh, Kurdish language is uh, being uh, treated here as something that is uh, worthy and, you know, great, yet in bad condition, and it needs to be uh, brought into order and regularity. And here, I think, is a, a crucial point where he talks about so that people might not say, oh, the Kurds, they have no origin, no knowledge, no base. With Ahmed Khani, we see the emergence of Kurdish peoplehood. And peoplehood is a political stage uh, that, is, that doesn't uh, amount to nationhood. So it is, in some sense, not fully a modern nation, and yet awareness of us as a collectivity beyond tribal uh, or kinship uh, uh, ties. Yes? Well, I mean, so he says the Kurds have no origin, knowledge, and base, so maybe in this, like, historical context, maybe the uh, Ottoman and then Safavid could say, okay, you you don't have, like, a like, great origin or like background so that's why he's, he sees it as a burden so I need to write it I, yes. I need to write my like great history of Kurds I mean, yeah. maybe like other nation exactly so like uh, Kurds is like a subgroup or like not yeah even today, today yeah. the Turks say you know <laughs> Kurdish is not a proper language you know a thousand words whatever so you know it sounds stupid but those guys are right in terms of constitutionally speaking, according to Turkish constitution, no such things as Kurdish exists, you know. So Kurds don't exist in that sense. So people say, you don't have a state, have you ever had a state, and so on. So this consciousness uh, takes an acute uh, kind of intense form with the uh, tension between Safavid and Ottomans and Kurds being uh, caught and, you know, have always fought found themselves in that condition, I think it matures, it, it, it becomes intensified in Khani's uh, uh, thinking, and it produces this quite uh, modern and very politically charged uh, uh, reading of uh, uh, Kurdish uh, uh, life. Yes. So back then, uh, Turks also did not have their history. I mean, like, there was no such thing as awareness of Turkishness or, uh, you know, in Anatolia, no uh, reverence of uh, Turkish historical past. You know, the consciousness of Turkish also did not exist back then. But I mean, that time, they, at least they had that caliph, you know, they were caliph of the Muslims. At least they can use like, this argument. Yeah. That's internal to, you know, intra-Ottoman uh, yeah. kind of um, distortion of representation, you know, of course, Ottomans didn't see themselves as peasant Turk or whatever Europe Turk. Yeah. So, uh, but but Kurds perceived them as Turks or even Romans. You know, yeah. we, we talk about Rome being Turks being referred to as Rome in uh, in the Kurdish imagination, uh, and so I think you know as much as it is Ottoman side, but Persian side is important in terms of literary achievements, yes. in terms of uh, you know poetry and so on. The, the, all of this creates a pressure on Kurdish intellect in this case and few people are in that position who are uh, who you know they are obviously Khani is a mullah you know he's a, a sheikh mullah whatever madrasa person who was an educator and a man of uh, art and literature yes uh, if I'm wrong please correct me in terms of his background so uh, but he's, he can think beyond immediate needs of, you know, village or town, and, and he can think about his whole people. He owes the borders of Kurds, you know, how do you know where, you know, you know, where Kurds are and who we are? It is only 
thanks to others. In the mirror of others, you can see yourself. So he turns to the right, he sees Persians, you know, and they are attacking or they are cl making claims. And he turns to the left, he sees Ottomans making claims. And these two pressures create a space, and that's us. So, uh, But us is here conceived in terms of a lack. You know, we could be, but we are not there. Why? And so that's why uh, Khani is, uh, in many ways, a political uh, theorist, at least the father of Kurdish political subjectivity. Kurdish subject is born as a result of a fracture or uh, a crack uh, between, uh, or the conflict <coughs> between the two empires, giving rise to Kurdishness as a political, unified political entity. In itself, he is part of a principality, a mir, and all the mirs are in conflict with each other. To conceive all of the Kurds together as one entity is almost nationalism. It's almost idea of nation, but he's not there yet. So I think my thesis is that peoplehood, so Khani operates at the level of peoplehood, so Kurds are conceived as a people. And so it's also, it's in line with the traditional uh, sense of justice and sense of proper behavior, where shame uh, is the uh, logic. So, you know, Kurds should uh, stand up and be self-reliant because it's a shameful situation. Everybody else is doing well, you know. That's what uh, you would hear in traditional society. It's not because it's great and good or it's profitable, but it is because it's, you know, this honorable thing to fail. You know, you have to have dignity. And, of course, modern individuals are interested in dignity, but they have other things as well. For example, if someone curses your mother or something, what are you going to do? If you are a traditional Kurd, you have to go and kill the person. I mean, if you are, yeah, you know, attack at least, you know, do something. Uh, a modern city person, what is he going to say? Stupid person, you know, what, you, know you, you will ignore. Uh, it, it's not worth the, you know, if you... Yeah, yeah, if yeah. Uh, something you know bad, or, yeah. yeah, so insult that is uh, uh, touching the nerves, and if so, the reactions. I'm trying to make a distinction between you know modern individuals' reaction or urban person's reaction to an insult. Uh, that person will rely on law and will make calculation. This is not worth, you know, of course, I should avoid this trouble. Whereas a traditional person who will be, have a heated response to the situation with uh, dramatic and, uh, you know, certain undesirable consequences. Hence the blood feud, you know, between families, people constantly killing themselves, each other or whatever. So my point is that the idea of shame uh, is central to uplifting Kurds, because Kurds cannot be uh, provoked or encouraged by other terms. They are not available yet. Reason doesn't operate, but you say, shame on you. Your father was killed by the others, and you should, you know, take revenge. So in this case, he's not saying that, but he says, look, everybody, they have their state, they have their literature and, you know, art, and yet, look at us. We are deprived of those things. So he's using, mobilizing this framework to, uh, to awaken this uh, Kurdish kind of consciousness. Of course, this is, you know, prior to nationalism in a very traditional society, but in part because of conditions and in part because of genius and, uh, yeah, um, I guess, greatness of uh, Hani as a thinker, uh, we, we see this situation. You have a question? Yeah. A point. I think so. There are some advantages to being independent as well, not belonging to a state. You know, when you are under a state, you are uh, the state constructs its own ideology, yeah. even in even in small orders. You know, and when you look at excluding like uh, the dem Greek democratic cities, for instance, uh, this has been the case in history. And when you look at the political works under these kinds of despotic regimes, you don't find much creative stuff. You know, it's mostly people living in exile that produce no novelty in, with respect to this political is, works. Yeah. So I think there is a bit of romanticism there and like, yeah. 
Yeah, it's too early to be romantic. So you are actually late. Uh, you are. Uh, what you say is true for more modern times, where you know you have access to literary production, writing pen, and so on. You have public sphere that can avoid the despotic rulers and so on. In traditional society, intellectual production, literary production is possible only through courtly environments. A despot is a perfect. Is a great uh, resource for literary production. Uh, you, say, you say you are great, and then you can write a beautiful poem, because you don't have to work in the field to get bread. So it allows people to uh, gain their freedom from necessity and nature to en enter into culture and you know produce something. So uh, I see your point, but it doesn't apply to him, because this is a time when uh, uh, Kurds are mostly beneath the level of uh, necessity. They are living natural biological life, born, you know, fight, eat, multiply, die, whatever, war, conflicts. And so uh, <coughs> permanence, permanence is gained when you liberate yourself from necessity, when you have time to write. Scholar, the words scholar or school, well, maybe not school, but uh, the word scholar is a person who is not engaged in uh, worldly activities, a person who is in um, uh, leisure. You have to be in leisure situation, you can be scholar. That's what it means. So in the past, everybody had to work in the field somewhere, right? So those people who are liberated from that by, uh, by collective sponsorship or for some reason, inheritance and so on, those people uh, produce things. Look at the philosophers, thinkers, you know, some, either they inherited something, there is something, or they live miserable lives. Look at Marx, poor guy, you know, tiny apartment, and he, he suffered a lot, and thanks to his friend who sponsored it, then he could write those things. Otherwise, he had to deliver pizza, or do some other taxi job, or something, you know, that's how uh, I So it, it, it is a, um, uh, it's a, uh, it, yeah, so we are talking about a moment that's uh, much earlier than modern times. Various nations have their own books, of course it's talking to, you know, peoples in that sense, or kingdoms. Anyway, so what the Kurds do not make love, one of their aims, it sounds like well, they don't make love, it's certain they do, uh, <laughs> but they do not make love, one of their aims, I think this should be refine this translate it should be like they do not make aesthetics one of their purposes so you know they that is they that is they do not engage in aesthetic production you know wor works of aesthetics and so hence you later you see this uh, desire uh, uh, lover and beloved uh, and when love is mentioned of course real and metaphoric love is a distinction that we find in all Sufi uh, literature Love is uh, uh, desirable and uh, great uh, only when it is directed to the ultimate uh, object of uh, love. Uh, so the worldly uh, uh, things that are worthy of love are metaphorical. So they should uh, love should pass through them and reach uh, enter into the permanence. Ultimate uh, object of love is God, of course. So so you can always in poems find the. Uh, uh, Hakiki Majazi, and it's referring to this metaphorical love and true love. Okay. Uh, so Kurds are, they do not lack uh, perfection, yet they are orphans lacking opportunities. It's also important. He's recognizing potential, but saying, you know, we need to change your conditions. I'm going to conclude soon. I think we are running uh, late. Uh, learning, art, prudence, perfection, poetry, love, book, and verse collection, such matters uh, be appreciated, but currencies be accepted. Uh, notice something being appreciated, literary stuff, and certain things being accepted, currencies. So sovereignty, political, literature, aesthetic thing. All right, I want to read this part, if you don't mind, because I love this part. <laughs> the flag of the measured word, read it, the flag of literary speech, I would have raised on top of the world, had we had a king, he says. I would have resurrected the soul of Malay Jaziri, 
put life back into Ali Hariri. And so pleased Faqih Tehran, he would forever be a fan. It's sad. He, he wrote with British English, so, <laughs> so it would rhyme if it was fun. You know. uh, okay, so Faqih Tehran would be forever pleased with this outcome. Now, these three names mentioned here, Malai Jaziri is the uh, giant of uh, poetic, love poetry in Kurdish tradition. So we talked about those names. And uh, Ali Hariri is uh, another literary figure whose uh, Diwan is lost, so it's it's, it's mysterious uh, name in some sense. And Faqih Tehran, uh, famous, we talked about that uh, last time. So resurrection of those souls, you know, ancestors uh, uh, be, being pleased with the achievement of Kurds and so on, it's, it's, uh, it sounds like modern nationalism. What else? You, you know, it's pretty modern uh, attitude. Okay, now it's your turn, my friend. Let's uh, finish this and liberate people from my poetic torture. <laughs> okay. However, the market is stagnant. No one is buying our garment, especially in this age when money is for us the darling and honey, where the greed for the income and dinar has made each of us an idolater. When you sell perfect knowledge for a copper and sell wisdom for a soul, no one would take Jami as a groom. No one would take Nizami as a servant. As I saw, this was the sign of the time that there was a war over the dying. An alchemist I wished to be, as I saw that was not to be. I worked equitably for a time, refining the impure jewelry. My heart could not bear cheating, never became a means to that purpose, forfeiting the religion without gaining the dinar. Then, unavoidably, I became a coppersmith. My hidden copper I exposed. It was stationary. I blessed. The blessing was effective, becoming a means to secure a need. These coins may be worthless, yet they are refined, pure, and priceless. With no defect, small change, and quite perfect, as general tender, they are valid. Pure Kurdish, not suspected, not gold to say whitened. Our copper is red and mill-made. It is not a silver lacking in gauge. So do not say that our coinage has little value, that it is unminted by a king of kings. Had it been engraved when minted, it would be in currency, not counterfeited. Beloved indebted to no one, so it is doomed and unfulfilled. The stationary of one's unsupported, if by a king not chartered, unsound by many an expert, acceptable by many a prudent. But the ruler of the age of learning never listened with understanding. The prince named Mirza, whose mere look is alchemy, cleansing impure hearts, refining spurious coins. One hundred weights of red copper at once turns them yellow with a glance. The high he would make low, sullenly. The low he would make high, kindly. Holding pashas as prisoners, releasing them as paupers. Every day a thousand mendicants, every moment a hundred beggars. He enriches with activity, wisely avoiding all symptoms of charity. If he would look at us just once with that elixir of blessed countenance, these words he would turn into poems, these coins he would change into dinars. But his look is exceedingly general. He does not see us as special. Still, he is a mercy to the public. O oh Lord, give him everlasting life. Thank you, John. So in this last part of uh, this section, we see a parallelism between minting coins and writing verse. Okay, production of poetry and minting coins, that is, exercise of sovereignty. These two things are matched and paralleled. And you can see how he goes back and forth between money being counterfeit or suspect or lacking currency and the verse not being appreciated, not being treated as worthy. Mm. And so if you have sovereignty, okay, if you write your verse in an unsovereign context, in an unsovereign language, your verse is not going to be appreciated. Okay? So your work becomes invalid literally. So his, his 
highlighting these two elements and then he comes to the conclusion of course it's time to say thank you king you are so great so prince of Bhutan Mirza he says he has such a great you know gaze he looks around and with him we are in security and so on but he's really using him as a puppet for as a symbol for sovereignty that is needed by Kurds to make their currency valid and their literature appreciated uh, so that's what cleans and impures like old coins that are no longer valid and so he himself here of course also Khani himself is like a prince who picked the stories of Kurds and purified them into coins that will be valid in the future as uh, literary uh, coins. Thank you very much for your patience.